keeper of the OIS, who will talk about wind of wood, new problems from OIS. Thank you, Jerome. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, so, I keep notebooks of all the interesting things, records of theorems and conjectures and so on. Uh, and at the back, I've been, for several years now, I've been collecting interesting problems, interesting sequences <coughs> in particular. And um, when I agreed to give this talk, I thought I would just keep track of the new sequences that um, would be worth reporting on. So this is just from really two months worth. Every couple of days, there's a sequence which seems sufficiently interesting that I make a note of it. And this is a selection of them from the, the past two months. Yeah, how many notebooks do you have so far? Oh, this is volume 114 of this sequence. <laughs> so um, so I, the first three slides are of a, a, a humorous nature. And this one came in an email. Um, when was it? December 28th. Somebody wrote and said, uh, I think you'll be interested in this, and it, it needs your help. What's the significance of 11, 12, 14, and 18? Because these numbers have, have, were found in crop circles in England. <laughs> so I wrote back and said, sorry, I can't help you. But I did, I wasn't upset, because I thought this is a perfect way to, uh, to begin the talk, and show <laughs> examples of things you should, that are not really interesting. <laughs> so, so the point is, there are, um, there are rings of crop circles, and some are in 11, and 12, and 14, and 18. And, um, so the question was, what was the mathematical significance of these? And the answer, of course, is zero. And then, here's another one. This was a sequence that somebody submitted. <laughs> the sequence numbers of the sequence that And I read. So this immediately got classified as NOGI, not of general interest. It was put on the list, on the wiki, of examples of what not to submit. And then, um, there's the number POW. This was new to me, it probably uh, some of you have seen it. This was uh, a, a compromise between pi and tau. But, because there's always the question, which is more fundamental, pi or two pi? Um, uh, which is sometimes called tau. And, so, um, and this was 1.5 pi, which is sequence number A197723, which is pi. So um, I don't know what the symbol is for pi. Uh. <laughs> Um, and then, coming to more serious matters, um, there's the famous $10,000 sequence that John Conway mentioned in a, a colloquium talk at Bell Labs. Um, uh, and he offered, he said, this is a really difficult question. And um, uh, he said, I'll, I'll pay $10,000 to anyone who can prove who can find when the sequence first gets within 5% of its limiting value. And um, Colin Mallows worked on this and found the answer, or at least found an answer. And John claimed that he didn't really say $10,000, but we had it on videotape, and I wrote it in my notebook because I was in the front row during his talk, so he paid up. Colin agreed not to cash the check. But that was <laughs> sequence five five. That was sequence four thousand and one, the classic ten thousand dollar sequence, which is defined by a Fibonacci kind of recurrence. That the nth term a of n is a of it's not an a, a of n minus one plus a of n minus two like the Fibonacci. It's a of a of n minus one plus a of n minus a of n minus one. That's the Hofstadter Conway sequence. But there's a, another one related to that described in a paper called The Chaotic Cousin of the Hofstadter Conway sequence, which is defined by A of n is A of A of n minus 1 plus A of n minus A of n minus 2 minus 1. Obviously, you could 
adjust this in many ways, but this one was a particularly interesting one. And so, um, the other day, um, Martin Pedersen uh, computed 10,000 terms of this and produced this graph, which I thought was quite remarkable. So I said, could you make, produce some more? And he came up with this. Now, there's something going on there. What's this twist? This is some mysterious process going on that I think it's worth looking into. That's, that's all. Oh yes, and if you look at A of n over n, this is um, 10 to the 8th terms. A of n over n ranges just between, um, roughly speaking, between 0.44 and 0.56. That's interesting. So maybe this could be... Is it not a tiny statement? It's given tiny. Sorry? No. What? <laughs> uh, what, what is the chaotic cousin? The, this is no. the chaotic cousin, yes. I oh, wonder the well-behaved cousin. This is no, the, this is the, not the well-behaved cousin. Oh. This is the chaotic cousin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know there are se yeah. several different yeah. papers with similar yeah. titles. No, this is yeah, the, the chaotic. Yeah. So it is 10 to the 8th terms. And what's going on? So the idea of this talk is to show you some interesting questions that maybe are not so difficult to, to uh, answer. And, if I had more time, I would work on them myself, but I'm offering them to you. So, uh, Richard Guy, when I was working on the book, the 1973, the Handbook of Integer Sequences, I would get letters from Richard Guy from all over the world. As he traveled around, he would collect sequences and send them to me. And this, this air letter was um, mailed on uh, June 24, 1971. He, he started writing it in Oxford, um, and he finished it in Cambridge, and he sent it to me at, uh, at Cornell, and I had moved from Cornell already to Bell Labs, and so it was forwarded, and it reached me, and the reason this came up was that one of these sequences, somebody was asking me how it was defined, I can't really read this, but um, this one here, which goes 1, 1, 2, 5, 15, 36, and so on. Someone was asking, in sequence 2844, someone was asking, well, how is this really defined? So I dug up the letter, scanned it in, and put it on. There, it's got about 15 sequences. So the scan is now attached to all of these sequences. Um, this is the second half of the of the letter, and really not very easy to read. But the, the sequence in question, the sequence C, which you can see here, is described in a very unclear way. So this would be worth looking into. I would like it if, one, if somebody would clarify. What is this? It's, a, it's got a, um, a definition and an explanation. I quoted from Richard Guy's letter, of what he says, and it's still not clear to me. But I didn't look at it too closely, and the person who wanted information about this hasn't followed up on it. He didn't even, didn't even say thank you, but um, it's available now. Now, in Richard's letter, he, he has a pair of sequences um, with the same start. So this one, 2844, is bracketed in his letter with another one that also begins 1, 1, 2, 5, 13, 102, <coughs> and then 295, whereas that has 296. But this one has a more precise definition. It's a number of polynomials <coughs> with non-negative integer coefficients, p of x, y, such that it's congruent to 1 mod x plus y minus 1, and p of 1 comma 1 is n. And the offset is 1, so there's supposed to be one polynomial um, for which p of 1, 1 is equal to 1, with congruent to 1 minus x plus 1 minus 1, and so on. So sequence, I added it. It wasn't in there. So uh, this was about 50 years ago. So I added it um, as 279196. And I don't even know what the counts are. I mean, what the, what 
the polynomials are for the first few rounds. So it might be interesting to look into this. And then later on in his letter, there is a bunch of sequences that need more terms. And um, these are related to things that people here might be interested in. So sequence 202, see the M sequence in his letter, it's a number of described as the number of irreducible ways to split the numbers 1 to 3M into N three-term arithmetic progressions, subject to some conditions which are not so clear. Um, and uh, 14 terms known as a type of that, that should be how Heinz. He computed just from the definition and found uh, that. And there's a unpublished thesis of Richard Novikos Novikovsky, which, um, who's a student of Richard Guy, which might have more information about this. So it came up in some games? Got the games? No, it's... I don't know what it, why it came up. It, there's only one sheet of paper. He didn't have room, really, to give much background. And it occurred to me, since there are many, um, many papers these days on additive combinatorics, maybe something can be said using them to apply to the sequence. Um, now, sequence I, again, the same kind of thing, self-conjugate inseparable solutions of x plus y equals 2z, um, where x, y, and z are are disjoint triples from the numbers one, 1 to 3m. And there's an example here. So the, from the numbers, you can partition the numbers 1 to 15 into five sets of triples, satisfying x plus y is 2z. So 2 plus 4 is twice 3, 5 plus 7 is twice 6, and so on. Again, the definition isn't clear. We need better examples. and. Hopefully, some formulas. <coughs> Why the concept conjugate? I don't know. Oh. So, you don't need the word self conjugate. It's all the solutions of x plus y equals 2z. I've told you just about everything I know yeah. about this. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the letter. <laughs> and we could ask Richard, but I didn't want to bother him yeah. since he probably didn't keep a copy of the letter. It was a long time ago. But it would be nice to have. still exists. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So, um, all right, <laughs> moving on. Um, Fibonacci's came up. Uh, somebody, they were created on the Reddit website <laughs> by someone called Teb Leffer. And the sequence was sent in by Peter Cagey, who's a regular contributor of sequences and edits to the OAIS. January 4th of this year. So the de definition is, you have a pile of nachos, 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 <laughs> whatever they are, they look like that and you eat them. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a pile of them, you have n of them, okay, and maybe you have two people playing, or maybe it doesn't matter. You remove the Fibonacci numbers from the pile. So first, suppose, say we have 23 nachos to start off with. We successively remove Fibonacci numbers from the pile. First we remove one, and then one, and then two. So after we've removed, removed one, we have 22. We take another one, 21. We take two more, 19. We take three, now there are 16 left. We take five away, and we're down to 11. We take eight away, and we're down to three. And we can't, the next Fibonacci number would be 13. So we can't remove 13, but we still have 3 left. So we start again. So we take the 3, and we remove Fibonacci numbers. So we remove 1, and we've got 2 left. We remove 1 again. So the Fibonacci numbers, are, in this case, are 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. We ignore the 0. So um, we remove 1 again and from the 2, and there's 1 left. The next Fibonacci number will be 2, and we can't subtract 2 from 1, so we start again. And we remove 1 from the 1, and we're left with 0. So there were three stages before we got to 0. 
So that's the third Fibonacci, Fibonacci oh, this number, <laughs> is three. It's a number of stages where you start with N chips and you remove them in this way. Of course, what you're really doing is looking for the partial sums of the Fibonacci numbers and subtracting them in the greedy way until, until you get that. So, anyway, so the sequence is 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2. And I mention this because there's a nice conjecture about, about when, when we first, if you look at the records, so the first time it takes three steps, three stages to get down to zero, the first time it takes four stages, and so on. Um, <coughs> Uh, you get the sequence 1, 3, 10, 30, 84, and so on. And we know 25 terms, and they grow pretty quickly. So that sequence at A280523, whereas the crucial thing you want to remember is sequence 280521. So the basic sequence of the, the Fibonacci shows is 280521. The records in that sequence. 280523, which is the first time we need n stages to get down to zero. And there's a conjecture about that. This is a bisection of a sequence, a Fibonacci type sequence, but you don't just add the two previous terms, you add half n. Why? Probably not hard, I suspect. And then I thought, well, what's really going on here? We could generalize this. Instead of using the Fibonacci numbers, why not use, say, the natural numbers, or the squares, or the triangular numbers? Each time we do it, we get a sequence. So if you just use the natural numbers as the number you remove, we first remove 1, and then 2, and 3, and 4, until we can't remove any more without getting a negative number. And we start again, and, keep, and remove 1, 2, 3, 4, look at the number of stages, that is what we're really doing there is removing the, tri the biggest triangular number we can from the stack and then repeating that. So it's shrinking a number down to zero by greedily subtracting triangular numbers. So that's an old sequence. That's sequence 57945 and the records in that, the ones that take the most steps, is another known sequence. Similarly for the triangular numbers, and there there's a conjecture that you never, I think this is also an interesting question, probably not that hard. If you're greedily subtracting, not triangular numbers, not partial sums of the 1 to n, partial sums of the triangular numbers, so in other words, pyramidal numbers, you would greedily subtract them, the conjecture is you never need more than five stages to get down to zero. Interesting looking open question. 2 to the n, that was there too. But if you use the squares, so you're subtracting squares successively, or partial sums of the squares if you like, that's a, that was a new sequence, and the, the records. So that sequence looks like this. So here's, here's how it works. We start off with n nachos, and we successively remove squares. So let's say we start with 36. We remove 1, that brings us down to 35. And we take away 4, down to 31, 9, down to 22, 16, and we get down to 6. Now the next square will be 25. We can't subtract 25 from 6, so we start again. We take 6, we remove 1, and then 4. Now we're down to 1. To start again, we can't subtract 9. So we subtract 1 and we get 0. So it took three stages to get down to 0. That shows subtracting squares. And um, the smallest number with that shows square that shows value n is a sequence that grows pretty rapidly. And Lars Lomberg, one of our regular contributors, worked out this. What's going on here? What are these numbers? What is their property? What's the magic property of those numbers? 
Fibonacci numbers came up again in another interesting question. Um, so somebody pointed out that an old sequence, 67182, was really in terrible shape. It was totally unclear what was going on. But when it was when you studied it, it really was actually a simple question. What's the smallest Fibonacci number whose digits add up to n? So, so a of n is the smallest Fibonacci number with sum of digits equal to n. Or if there is no if there is no number whose digital sum is n, it's minus one. Actually, the original version had zeros. If it was but I changed it because zero is actually a legitimate value because the first Fibonacci number zero is <coughs> digital sum zero. The smallest Fibonacci number with digital sum one is one, two, two, three, three. And um, if you want digital sum four, you can get it by looking at the Fibonacci number 13. So that's the fourth term. The fifth term, digital sum five, well, five is a Fibonacci number. Now, what about six? Well, six, there was a conjectured value of minus one, and there were other conjectured values, and there were a lot of conjectured va values, and not a single one had been proved. And this was really, I thought, really ridiculous. That was in 2002. Uh, Surely we can make some progress on this problem now. So um, I sent a memo to the sequence fans mailing list saying, look, here's a nice problem. Um, how about making some progress on this? And immediately someone, one of our guys went back and said, it's not going to happen. This is too hard for 21st century mathematics. We're not ready for this problem. And I, said, I felt a bit defensive about this, so I said, look, you could look at it more than 100. The Fibonacci numbers more than 100 have period 300. Maybe that will tell you something. And um, the same day, no, the next day, two people independently, Joseph Myers and Don Rebel, on the sequence of mailing list, said, you were close. You should have looked at it more Fibonacci numbers mod 9999, because that doesn't change the digital sum. If, this, if there was a Fibonacci number with digital sum 6, if you read it mod 9999, it would still have digital sum 6. So you just have to look at 600 numbers, and uh, none of them have digital number six, no, sum 6. So there is no Fibonacci number with digital sum minus one. So this one is now a theorem. All the others are still conjectures. I hope it would be nice if you could help. With no, but the same approach may work. Only 999. 999 will get bigger. Maybe. Yeah. I suspect it's not quite as, as easy as that. So you could do it in base two. Look at the binary representation of the Fibonacci numbers and ask, what's the smallest Fibonacci number who, which in base two has n ones? And well, so there's a sequence um, two 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 nine six, which is it's it's a, a, a triangle, and in each row of the triangle is a list of all the numbers who, that, that, are, um, that have weight, have digital sum, in binary, equal to n. So there's a theorem of uh, Carmichael that you can use to show that if, you, if, if there are only four Fibonacci numbers that, have, that are powers of two, the only Fibonacci numbers that have a single one in binary are one, two, are one, one, two, and eight. So that's the weight one row of the triangle. Weight two, um, it was known, easy to check, 
the three, 3, 5, 34, and 144 have, have uh, two ones in them. And there were no other values known. So Charles Greathouse posted this on Math Overflow. And no Elkies kindly replied and said, um, well, this is probably hard. He said two things. And I have the first remark here and the second remark on the next slide. This, the first remark, he says that, that each row of this triangle is finite. He said there are only finitely many Fibonacci numbers with a, with a given binary weight because the equation 2 to the 1 plus dot 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 plus 2 to the e2, 2 to the e k, um, equals v to the n plus v to the minus n of the root 5. It's an S unit equation in x plus 2 variables over q adjoin root 5. Now, I do not understand. And, uh, and therefore, it's finite. You're nodding? Yeah. Oh, good. Please explain it to me afterwards. <laughs> good. So it's a finite. So this triangle is well defined. Really finite. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no effective proof. Ah, so it's not finite. Yes. Okay, no. Right. But, right. but at least he was on the next slide, he was able to prove that the weight 2 list is complete. And here's the proof, and it's just a series of elementary arguments. Um, but at the end, he says, I doubt that one can prove that such a technique can work for all values for x. Here's the case x equals 2. Yes. All right, so the next topic is carryless stuff when there are no carries. Now, this started out when um, Mark Lebrun, who's an old friend, lives in California, he said, did I ever look at carryless arithmetic? And there are actually two kinds of carryless arithmetic. I'm just going to talk briefly about one kind. So this kind of carryless arithmetic, there's an island in the Pacific where they don't have many possessions. And their arithmetic, and it's, and it's just as well, because their arithmetic is a bit strange. This is a hypothetical island. <laughs> it's a formal penal colony. <laughs> and on this island, the arithmetic has no carries. So when you add 6 and 7, normally you would get 3 and carry 1, you get 13. But now you, you get three. <coughs> I mean, it's strange, but that's how it is on this island. Six plus seven is three. And when you multiply, again, no carries. So six times seven, it's not 42. Forget the four, it's two. So this is carryless arithmetic. And here's an example of if you add seven, eight, five to three, seven, six, you say five plus six is one. Eight plus seven is five. Seven plus three. It's 10, but you forget the one, you get 0. So, so 785 plus 376 is 51. So you can see the bookkeeping on this island is not very precise. But still, it's a well-defined um, arithmetic in a way, when you multiply it. So of course, the question is, what are the primes? And so we wrote this up as a paper. It appeared in the College Math Journal. It actually won a prize for the for, um, for some, the Polio Prize. We, we like this. This is from the carryless islands. There are no carries. So and multiplication isn't commutative. Right. No, no, commutative is okay. It's not. No, can, multiplication is not going to be commutative. Because you're using the second factor to determine how you multiply. No. You multiply by 9, yeah, and then no. you multiply by 5. And add it. Well, if you look the other way around, you multiply by three, and then by four, and then by six, things will look different. Five fifty-nine times six four three. Yeah, well, doing all the multiplies pairwise, so it should, yeah, it should be. Good. 
So we multiply three. Three nines are seven. Three fives are five. Four nines are six. Um, uh, four fives are twenty. 